Jadi di Indonesia itu ada 5,4 juta ibu hamil setiap tahunnya. Akan tetapi dokter kandungan itu hanya sekitar 4 ribu. Sangat penting, uh, koneksi internet bagi bidan sangat penting. Kenapa ini terkait masalah akses? Itu wilayah kerja kami, 26 puskesmas dengan geografis yang sangat sulit. COVID-19 ini memang sangat berpengaruh pada kesehatan ibu. Memang kunjungan rumah itu sudah dilakukan dari dulu, tapi uh, tidak sebanyak yang COVID ini. Dengan adanya COVID ini memang para ibu kecenderungannya adalah mereka enggan untuk datang ke puskesmas atau ke rumah sakit. CTG adalah alat kardiotokografi untuk mendeteksi kesejahteraan janin. Jadi bidan dapat mengirimkan hasil CTG kepada dokter dalam waktu 7 detik. Pertama periksa dengar uh, denyut jantung bayi, rasa heran, rasa bahagia juga. Rasa herannya karena uh, ibu bidan itu sangat penting bagi beta. Dari dashboard itu saya bisa memantau 26 puskesmas, baik jumlah ibu hamilnya dan faktor risiko. Dengan adanya koneksi internet, sangat membantu bidan mengetahui faktor risiko sehingga menekan angka kematian ibu dan anak khususnya di Kabupaten Kupang. Kami yakin bahwa agar Indonesia bisa lebih sehat, akses lebih baik untuk kesehatan, Inovasi ke depannya pasti membutuhkan internet connectivity. Nah ini uh, sebuah roadmap yang panjang bagi kami dan kami terus berusaha untuk berinovasi di situ. Connectivity itu menjadi kunci sih mas. Welcome to the launch of the fifth annual Inclusive Internet Index by the Economist Intelligence Unit, commissioned by Facebook. I'm Robert Pepper, Head of Global Connectivity Policy and Planning at Facebook, and this study and annual event is one of the highlights of my year. We usually launch the 3i report, as we call it, uh, in Barcelona during Mobile World Congress, but we're remote and virtual again this year because of the pandemic. But, you know, a silver lining of having a remote event is that people who might not be available for an in-person event during the jam-packed agenda in Barcelona can join us today. And so I'm very pleased that we are able to do it with a great panel. We're going to begin with Claire Casey, who's the Global Managing Director for Public Policy at the Economist Intelligence Unit. And she's going to present the key highlights of this year's 3i study, including the value of internet survey. Claire? Thank you, Pepper. I'm delighted to be here to present what is now our fifth edition of the Inclusive Internet Index. This past year has made clear just how vital the internet is for us as individuals and for our societies. We've seen internet surge around the world, as well as our dependence on it for basic necessities and for our overall well-being. We've all lived that experience, um, but it's also dramatically raised the cost of being offline. So with the completion of this year's study, we have the first empirical look at not just the state of the internet leading into the pandemic, but also how internet quality, affordability, and user perceptions changed over the past year. I thought the best place to start would be be an explanation of what the 3i is and what it's intended to achieve. We began this project with the intention of building an analytical tool that would enable cross-country assessment of internet inclusivity. And that's an internet that is widely available, affordable, and allows usage that promotes positive social and economic outcomes. We wanted a tool that would allow us to compare countries and to track progress over time. There are 120 economies included in the index, and together they represent 96% of the world's population and 98% of global GDP. 
We assess these countries through a framework of 57 indicators, which include a survey of 5,800 people around the world. And that's to understand not just what's being tracked officially, but also how people are experiencing the internet. And that's particularly important this year. When we released the fourth edition of the index a little more than a year ago, we were just at the beginning of what has become a once in a, in a century pandemic. And as lockdown swept the globe, people turned to the internet. Um, for a whole host of activities, from entertainment to fitness. Um, but perhaps what's most notable in our survey responses is that the most important increases in uses were for vital activities, our education, our work, and our connection with friends and family. And the internet's ability to foster resilience, whether it's combating social isolation or maintaining a family's income, is in one sense a marker for how far we've come um, since the 3i began five years ago. More than half of the world's population is now connected, and that's a significant achievement. But as I mentioned earlier, this shift online makes inclusivity even more urgent. 63% of our survey respondents globally saw COVID-19 widening the economic divide between those who have access to the internet and those who do not. And the cost of being offline and underconnected carries really far reaching consequences. And this divide exists everywhere. Um, this does not depend on, on what region you're sitting in or what income level your country has. I know I'm sitting in Washington, DC today, and officials here have had to go door to door um, to, to focus on vaccine, equitable vaccine distribution, because the original plan, which was just to manage it online, left large communities without access to, to vaccine. So this just one an example. Um, but I think it's important to note that when you look at the data, this economic divide is most keenly felt in those regions with the lowest rate of internet use. Um, and so the consequences of that are really significant, not just maintaining income today, but also access to opportunity. So when I, when I refer to access to opportunity, I'm thinking about the life course um, and focusing here on students. What we saw is that around the world, students with internet access were able to continue to access education even when their schools closed. So among the survey respondents, and I wanna note here that our survey respondents have internet access. So this isn't touching on those folks who, who don't have access to the internet. But seven out of 10 households with children under 18 had students who needed to engage in online learning at some point due to school closures. You'll see that Europe reported the lowest reliance on online education, but that reflects the fact that there were less frequent school closures in that region. Um, over 70% of respondents in low income and lower middle income countries needed to rely on online education, which means when you think about the number of people who aren't online, that becomes really a significant um, barrier to education and to then what positive life outcomes overall are lasting, lasting consequences. And that's not just a question of accessibility, but also availability, affordability, and quality. Um, one of the stories that's positive across this um, five-year period is that we've seen quality improve across all regions, and that continued this year. Um, but slow speeds still limit access to essential activities in low and lower middle income countries. And I wanted to talk a bit about this chart. So what we tried to do here is compare average mobile download speeds to some pretty standard uses of the internet. And the dark blue line that you see across the chart represents two users engaging in a social media platform and a video conference. That could be a work meeting or an online class. And what you see is the average download speed is just marginally sufficient in Latin America and insufficient across Sub-Saharan Sub Africa. And that's average. So in much of Sub-Saharan Africa, mobile download speeds would barely be sufficient for just one user. So in households in these regions where multiple members of the family might need to use the internet for work or school, internet quality can place real limitations on what's possible. One of the elements there is a reliance on 2G, which is the most prevalent mobile technology in some of these regions, um, which makes data intensive activities not practical. So the expansion of 4G coverage becomes a critical component of improving internet quality. And 4G coverage is expanding. The pace has slowed, unfortunately. So since the 3i's first edition, 
We've seen 4G coverage grow from about 48% of people in 3i countries to 76% today. Coverage is nearly universal in high income countries, but coverage lags as income levels fall. Um, and today it's woefully insufficient in low income countries at just 32% of the population covered today. That said, there are some exceptions. Um, Rwanda has achieved almost universal coverage and Uganda has achieved 57% coverage. Um, I'm sorry, 57% of, the of their population is covered by 4G. And so those are cases worth digging into to better understand what's working and how it might be replicated elsewhere. Perhaps, at least to me, the most encouraging finding this year is that mobile data is getting more affordable. We measure affordability as the cost of one gigabyte of mobile broadband data as a sh monthly share of GNI per capita. And as we were putting this index together this year, we knew that the nominal price of data had fallen um, in the 70 countries that we have data for this year. But the big open question was, would this be washed away by falling incomes due to the pandemic? And the good news that is that it was not. Um, the mobile data price uh, decreases outpaced um, any decreases in income. So we actually saw gains across the board in affordability. And perhaps even more heartening, the biggest gains were where it's needed the most, low-income countries. That said, 6.8% of monthly per capita income is still too expensive, um, and it means that mobile data is out of reach for many in these economies, but we're heading in the right direction, and the progress was really re very encouraging. This was also reflected in our survey responses. So what we saw is that survey responses in low-income countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, said that since the beginning of the pandemic, the affordability of their internet improved, as did its connection speed and reliability. What does that mean? Um, it's possible that this crisis galvanized policymakers and motivated upgrades to existing internet systems, making the investments that would have the biggest immediate impact. More study will need to be done to better understand the underlying drivers of these changes and what can be done to continue this positive trend. But the, the value of an index like this it, is it enables us to identify, identify these opportunities for, for digging deeper and finding answers. Um, some less positive news came out of the study with regard to the gender gap, which really remains a persistent issue. Some countries made commendable progress, um, including Colombia, um, which have has halved its gender gap since it was first included in the 3i in year two. Um, it was 11.2% that year. It's just 4.5% today. Regionally, the biggest gender gaps we see are in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And I thought that we could just zero in on South Asia today because it provides a powerful example of how uneven progress is on this issue. The gender gap in um, South Asia is the highest among 3i countries of any region or sub-region. It's 46% on average. There has been some progress in the region. So Sri Lanka was first included in the third edition of the 3i, and it had a gender gap of 40%. Today, that's fallen to just 12.5%, so really remarkable progress. Pakistan, which has one of the highest gender gaps in the world, has actually made steady progress in closing that gap every year, including improving it by six percentage points over the past year. But we also see, and mind you, 65% is much too high, but it's encouraging progress. Less encouraging is India, which already, again, had one of the worst gender gaps in the world at 57% last year. That jumped a further four points this year to 61%. So what's keeping women from staying connected? Affordability is one issue. We do see women reporting less positive results than men um, on affordability. But these are some of the countries with some of the lowest um, prices for mobile data in the, in the world, income countries, and as a share and I. So, so that's not driving this here. There's, there's more to it. Um, and with this per persistent gap, we know there are other factors at play. So addressing this issue really merits deeper study to enable meaningful action to take to, to, to correct the gender gap around the world. This is important because of what it means for equality of opportunity going forward. This past year, we've gotten a glimpse into our digital future. It's a future in which our lives and our well-being are inextricably linked to the internet. 
And this shift looks likely to stay. Globally, more than two thirds of survey respondents expected to use the internet about the same or more for a variety of activities than during the pandemic. So once it passes, they think they'll, they'll use it the same or more for a variety of activities. And what was so striking about this result was the consistency in responses by region and income group. As researchers, we're always looking to see where there's variation and understand what might be behind that. And in this, in this question, Question, the answers were strikingly consistent. But at a time when regular access and sufficient data and a decent speed are just the bare minimum to, um, to constitute connectedness, many people really still have to ration their internet connections if they're connected at all. And while progress has been made over the last five years, we're seeing that progress concentrated in high income and middle income countries. And as you can see from this chart here, the share of people offline in low income 3i countries still stands above 85%. And for me, that's a call to action. Governments and industry stakeholders must work together to build a more inclusive internet today so that the opportunities and the benefits of our increasingly digital world are available to, to everyone. As, as you said to kick us off, Pepper, all of our findings are available um, on our website. We're posted we post on the Inclusive Internet Index website. The analysis that we did is available in the form of an executive study. We also produce a methodology report so you can dig into our approach, test it yourselves. Um, researchers, ICT professionals, and the public can access the index and all the rich underlying data through an interactive dashboard, which is in an Excel format. Um, this year, users will also be able to access five years worth of data and scores for 120 countries, either through that dashboard or through uh, CSV files. So it's a really rich data set on internet inclusion over the past five years, and we encourage everyone to dig into it, dig into the findings, and apply it to your own research questions. And you can find all of this at theinclusiveinternet.eiu.com, and we also welcome questions um, and comments from, from folks everywhere. And thank you. Thank you, Claire. That was, that was, that was great. I mean, uh, this year, the, the data are so rich, especially during the, uh, uh, the pandemic. Um, we now have a terrific group of panelists to provide reflections and insights on the report and, and Claire's presentation. We always start with our colleagues uh, at GSMA because we not only usually launch this um, at Mobile World Congress, but GSMA is one of our partners on the data. And every year, uh, GSMA does a also their own index on uh, mobile um, accessibility. And so uh, Gennaro Cruz, who's the Director of Policy for the Digital Inclusion Programs at GSMA, um, is going to, you know, you know, be next. Uh, and Janera, I, I have a question, especially as it relates back to the work that you've been doing uh, at GSMA, and that is, what are the general trends that you are seeing in terms of the evolution of the connectivity gap, especially in emerging markets, since you focus on the digital inclusion program at GSMA? And how does that uh, compare with or fit with what uh, Claire just presented? Yeah, thank you, Pepper, and, and thank you for having me. Um, it's sad that we cannot do this at MWC, but uh, hopefully, yeah. end of June, you will be able to join us there for, for a hybrid event. Um, this is this is something that we do a lot of research on: um, digital inclusion, how to close the connectivity gap. is uh, you know it's a key topic for the GSMA and for mobile operators worldwide. Uh, so as you know, we, we have um, a, a complementary index that where we look at this uh, with similar trends. And our findings this, this year really resonate to what just uh, Claire just presented to us. In terms of the mega trends, and I want to really focus on, on, on that, not to give you too many statistics, but really what we see is if you look at the number of, of people that are unconnected worldwide, uh, we're broadly speaking about 4 billion people. Um, but if you dig deeper, what you see is that 85% of those unconnected are actually covered by a mobile broadband network, which means 3G or, or higher. What this means is that the, what we call the usage gap, so those that are covered 
but not connecting, is six times larger than those who are not covered um, by a mobile broadband network, right? So, so this is really, really important uh, for the private sector, but also for uh, policymakers when we want to address uh, this connectivity gap, what we see is that we need to put the focus really on this usage gap. Those who are covered but not connecting. Why they are not connecting? And Claire gave us some, some insights on that and, and, and we see that ourselves. And I'll discuss that in a second. But So why do we observe this mega trend? Um, this is mainly because there has been historically a lot of investment in infrastructure. Right? We estimate that since 2015, there has been around $270 billion uh, invested by mobile operators in deploying networks and upgrading networks, right? bringing coverage to, to really high uh, rates of, of, in terms of percentage of the population. Right? Like 3G coverage increased from 46% to 82% in, in, in that period. So that is huge. That is really a... Um, a large amount of the population that is now covered by this broadband network. So, so we really need to go deeper into what's happening, why uh, even though people have access, they are not connected. Um, another trend that we see, uh, and this really resonates to what Claire just presented, is uh, we see uh, the gender gap and the disability gap are persisting, right? Same as with rural and urban. These gaps, uh, we see them reducing, but not at the speed that we would like. Uh, we see, for example, the gender gap decreasing from 2018 to 2019. We estimate that globally um, that reduced from 23 to 20%. Right? That is uh, it's a good improvement, but it's, it's not enough. And it's really these pockets uh, of underserved populations which are consistently being underserved and which are um, keeping that connectivity gap uh, especially on the usage front, uh, not narrowing down. So I guess the, the, the main thing or, or that we are seeing that, that we think it's important to highlight is that we need to focus on the usage, uh, what is happening with that 80% of people who are not connecting because the, uh, there is something other than access, they are covered, they're not getting connected, and look at the barriers that these populations are facing in terms of affordability, lack of skills, uh, lack of awareness, and also you know, growing safety and security uh, concerns that are preventing them from, from uh, getting online. Thank you, Janera. This is uh, very consistent uh, with the findings and really the shift that we've seen over five years from, uh, you know, the gap on coverage to actually now with all of the investments in five years uh, to um, uh, that's still important, but it's really pivoting to the, the usage. Um, the usage gap is, as you put it, um, I want to actually shift because I think it's really appropriate at this point um, uh, to welcome back our next panelist, um, Doreen Bogdan Martin, director of the Telecommunications Development Bureau at the ITU. And you know, thank you for participating in all five years of our uh, of our three I launches. You're really, really the veteran here. Uh, and I also want to thank you and the ITU, and specifically your team, on your collaboration on the study. Um, much of the key data come from the ITU as the gold standard to collect data from uh, operators and uh, government member states from around the world. And you've made that available in a partnership for five years now. And so we really, really, really appreciate that. Um, from your perspective now, right, of five years of the study's findings, you know, what's changed over time? What struck you as the really the most, you know, lesson learned or the your takeaway from, from this year's study? And, and how do these findings affect the way that you are thinking about the work that you're doing leading uh, the Development Bureau at the ITU. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robert. And it's great to be here. I also wish we were together physically in, in Barcelona. Hopefully that will, that will happen again soon. 
Um, maybe first to Claire's point, when she asked about the long-term shift, are we seeing a long-term shift in connectivity? I would say definitely yes. I think um, there's no doubt that digital is here to stay. And of course, this goes to the heart of our mission at the ITU to connect the world. So um, really happy that um, I can join you for the fifth year in a row. Of course, we haven't aged in the past five years. Uh, but connectivity has definitely changed in the past five years. Um, and as our friend from GSMA just, just spoke about, we used to be very focused on, on coverage and now we're very focused on, on usage and, and the usage gap. Um, of course, um, what's great about having done this for five years, you now have this really valuable time series of data uh, which I think is great because it helps us to assess progress, uh, see the trends, and it also helps us to understand what are the new gaps and, and, and challenges that you have so clearly identified in, in this year's report. Um, I think the, the, what the findings show me um, and, and speak to me is that whole new level <clears throat> of urgency that you have, um, that you have highlighted. Uh, I certainly agree, as the report notes, that the historic pandemic makes connectivity more vital than ever. Uh, I think, Robert, uh, we've been advocating for years on the importance of connectivity, of course, going back to Sir Donald Maitland and the missing link back in the 80s, and of course, in 2003 and five with the WISIS making the case that you know connectivity is an essential enabler. And then, of course, in the 2030 agenda process, pushing for that goal 18 that we never got. Little did we know that we needed a pandemic to actually put the spotlight on, on connectivity uh, with the world, of course, moving <clears throat> overnight uh, and, and myself doing too many, too many online meetings and, and continuously losing my voice. Uh, but the, the pandemic really showed the world the incredible role that the internet plays in enabling life to continue despite disruptions. Um, of course, that was for the lucky ones. We have 3.7 billion people, as has already been, been noted, that didn't have access to the internet. And COVID has exposed those deep inequalities, as you have well noted in, in this year's report. Um, I think the index provides um, important backing to the gaps and, and really makes that clear case for universal, meaningful connectivity ever more clear. Um, the data do reveal positive trends, but they also reflect things that, that keep me awake at night. Uh, I would say on the good side, of course, we saw the, the number of mobile broadband subscriptions uh, increasing the 3G, 4G coverage, the affordability of, of handsets improving, uh, and all of those things trended positively, um, illustrating that the inter internet is of course more available and more affordable. However, on the price of data, in many cases it's still too expensive, especially in least developed countries. And I think this is something that also uh, backs up our recent policy brief on affordability that we launched at the end of, of last year. On the concerning side, the things that keep us up at night, these barriers. So of course the quality issue is a problem with some improvements, but when we think about the 1.6 billion learners that were impacted, that quality issue is a real problem. Uh, the rural electrification issue, which of course is included under your availability domain, <clears throat> that's a big problem. Affordability of services, uh, as I just mentioned, Digital literacy, those trust and safety issues falling under your, your readiness domain, still big challenges. And COVID has really put the spotlight there. And then, of course, that other piece on misinformation. So that relevance piece of, uh, of the 3i um, index uh, really has, um, has, a, has had a big impact, uh, of course, during COVID with so much misinformation out there. Uh, other big challenges that learning loss that I mentioned with the three with the 1.6 billion learners impacted. We saw nine out of 10 students in Africa not having access to the internet. That's a huge problem. Uh, and of course, the stubborn gender digital divide. And of course, WEF has just released released their their gender report, noting that COVID put us back 36 years 
in terms of gender parity, which means it's going to take 135 years uh, to reach parity. So that's a huge concern. And maybe just to conclude, um, the, the point that, that the report makes on partnerships, 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 partnerships. Nobody can do this alone. There's lots of gaps and challenges out there. Uh, digital is here to stay. And the only way that we can, we can get there and bridge the digital divide is through partnerships. So Robert, I'll stop there. I'll get a drink of water and I'll come back to you. Thank you. No, thank you very, very much, Doreen. I mean, these are great, uh, great highlights and, and, and insights. Um, we're very privileged <clears throat> to have our next panelist, uh, 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 Walid uh, Dabid, who's the Vice Minister of Connectivity and Digitization at the Ministry of Information and Communications Technologies in Colombia. Uh, Vice Minister, I really, really appreciate uh, you're taking the time today to join us. Um, you know, Colombia, as the report points out, is doing quite well uh, and has made really significant progress over the last several years. And we've tracked that year over year in the index. How have you achieved, how have you achieved that progress? And what do you see, more importantly, what do you see as your major challenges going forward to continue to improve, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic um, over the next several months in the year. Uh, Vice Minister. Um, thank you, Robert, and thank you for the invitation. Um, well, there's so much information uh, that has to be shared just to uh, kind of show you the strategy that the government has been following through throughout the years. Um, it, I think it's a structure of our government that allows us to modernize our laws based on statistical information that we have. We have a, a national planning department and, uh, and, and statistics department. And what they do is they gather the information, see what the problems and the issues are. And then based on that, they establish a strategy that goes through the years. It doesn't matter what administration comes in. So this is a this is an, an strategy that has uh, lasted for the last ten years. So we are now starting to see the results. I mean the improvements of of all that uh, uh, government investment that we have been doing in the strategies. Now we still know that we have weaknesses and we're aware of them. So every time um, a government comes in, or I'm sorry, uh, um, an administration comes in, they have a national plan to be developed in those four years. And it's based on the information that the national planning department has. So the, what they try to do is better those numbers. Um, in this uh, administration, knowing that the rural areas were not that covered, what we did, we started structuring projects that would allow uh, that to happen. So by the end of 2025, we'll achieve 80% coverage in the rural areas. So those impacts are based on the strategy that has come. And for example, we're talking about coverage of uh, 4G. So we have an, a spectrum auction in to, uh, 19 and because we modernized the law we're not mo we're now not concentrated on financial revenue for the government but more um, um, the uh, social impact leaving more resources to the private sector so they can deploy faster and wider so those are the kinds of strategies that we follow in order to get this kind of results and now for the future uh, because now there's new technologies coming in, like 5G. We're analyzing now, based on, on, on what's happening due to the pandemic, the economical recovery. Now we're coming up with uh, um, kind of new models to do this kind of, 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 of projects. Um, like, you know, we can not only concentrate on uh, the, the, the big cities where uh, uh, return on investment is assured for the operators living out the rural areas in the future for 5G. So we're coming up with, yeah, doing that divide, but then having like a, a public-private uh, partnership just to develop that kind of infrastructure in the rural, rural areas. Kind of, we see what has been done in other countries. We see the projects, the, the, the initiative that other countries have been doing, 
and we analyze if they work or do not work for them. And then we see what the challenges they had and try to fix them and Colombianize them. Is that the, the, the term that we use is see, bring those to our country and see how it works to our market and um, structure them in a, in, in a way that it works for us. Now, the other advantage is that we don't work alone. Uh, what we do is we work with academia, academia and we work with the private sector. Uh, with uh, uh, institutions like GSMA, uh, we understand what the challenges are and what we do with, with through public policy, we try to correct them to make sure that they can, you know, develop their the, the sector, the industry. But everything everything that we do is not to benefit the operators and operator for their margins. Is more that allowing them because they have to compromise. That if we allow them to lower the, the the financial resources that they have to pay to the government, they still to have to compromise and they pay in a certain way and in a certain amount of time. So we talk uh, to everyone just to make sure that our uh, strategies go along, works for the government, works for the operator, but at the end, the benefit is for our people. No, thank, thank you very much, Vice Minister. In fact, you make a really important point that um, many of us have been talking about uh, for years, including our, our next speaker uh, uh, presenter, but also uh, you know Doreen at the ITU, and that is that when you talked about not having a goal of maximizing revenue during spectrum auctions, but rather um, making sure that the spectrum is is available, um, that's actually quite important because there are too many countries in which you know the finance minister wants more money um, and uh, you know the the ICT minister says wait we have to get the spectrum out there and so the fact that you've been able to do this in Colombia I think is is extremely um, important and as a as a model uh, for other countries and, and that actually leads me to uh, welcome our next panelist uh, uh, you know Bettina Germazi who is the director of digital development for the infrastructure uh, group practice group at the World Bank, and again one of our close partners, and has been doing just amazing work um, with all of the projects, uh, including you know, one of your more recent ones, your Africa Moonshot, which was a partnership with you know the ITU and the UN Broadband Commission. Uh, Butina, what are the main points from the survey um, and the index that drew your attention this year? You know your kind of takeaways, big ahas, and how do you see the linkages to the work that you're doing uh, and that you're managing at the bank uh, and linking them together? Thank you so much, Robert, and uh, really congratulations to the team uh, for this timely analysis. Uh, we all had the uh, intuition uh, that digital transformation did uh, accelerate during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this is based on multiple stories, the way the conversation around digital agenda really moved from why it is important to how. This is what we're hearing from, from governments uh, and also based on our own experience. But I think what the survey really and the index um, adds at this particular time is that it brings a quantitative approach and confirms many of the hypotheses that we had. Uh, it also rings uh, the bell really high around the risk of digital exclusion. So uh, very important uh, and very timely. Uh, I'd like to mention three points from this analysis that to me are very, very important and many of them have been already raised by uh, the other panelists. Uh, the first one, uh, based on the survey, uh, we see that consumers' behavior has been changed and this will be, to some extent, permanent. I think this is a very important uh, element. Uh, the role of digital as a support instrument uh, was not restricted to social interactions, to work and education and public services. Uh, almost half of the respondents felt that the internet helped them decide what they want in life, discover their potential and get more confidence. So to me, this shows uh, the deeper level of digital adoption 
that we need to capitalize on as we think about building back better. The fact that this was not just one-off experience and will lead the way to a deeper adoption is a very important finding. Uh, I think this sets the bar higher for all of us, uh, operators, content providers, policy makers, development institutions, to pay more attention to consumer and citizens' growing digital expectations uh, needed, uh, in fact, to uh, keep up the interest uh, that almost happened by accident, uh, but a great way for building back uh, better. My second point, uh, which was mentioned uh, today, is this shift on how we define the digital divide. Uh, and basically thinking about you know, the old divide as uh, understood around the, the access gap, uh, but also the new divide around the usage gap. Um, this requires uh, a fresher approach on how we tackle it. Uh, and I think you know, the report uh, brings very good elements there. Uh, so just uh, you know, staying a little bit on the access gap, great progress that happened, um, very good uh, effort from the industry, uh, connected the unconnected. I think the report shows that there is still a lot of work that needs to happen to bring 4G coverage, uh, especially to the least developed countries and to the remote and rural areas. So that remains within the gap, the access gap agenda, uh, an area of further focus, uh, including for us as we work with governments on addressing the gaps. Uh, the fixed broadband agenda is also far more unachieved in many developing countries. So that's also something that uh, we could look uh, into, uh, especially in the areas uh, as shown in the COVID situation, the need for a simultaneous uh, connection at household level for businesses and for public administration is, is an, important, an important point. Uh, I like very much uh, that the uh, addition or, or the focus within the access on the progress on electrification. Uh, I just came from a meeting with young MPs now before starting the discussion today. And the first question of a young member of parliament was, how do we think access to energy and access digital as a twin objective? Uh, and I think the elements in the report are very important. Uh, according to the International Energy Agency, the population without access to electricity is expected to increase after six years of decline. So it's an important agenda as we think about digital, but you know, the, the, the non-digital elements of access is very important. Uh, and of course, as we go to the digital uh, usage gap, I mean, the issues around affordability, the, the issues around what policy and regulatory elements need to be in place to make sure that there is affordable access. And it's nice to see a direction of traffic that shows you know, good elements of prices uh, going down. How do we accelerate this is, is very important. How do we accelerate also the issues around affordability of, of handsets? Uh, and this is a good uh, exercise that we're, uh, uh, you know, working together on. And I look forward to, 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 to the results there. My third point uh, is that our challenge to close this divide, both old and new, or access and, and usage, is absolutely urgent. Uh, in fact, it was already urgent since yesterday. Uh, and now, clearly, any digital gap could amplify economic and social inequalities, not only between countries, but within countries. And COVID is basically shown to be a pandemic of inequalities. So what role digital can play uh, to make sure that, that we address these issues? And important to think about it in this global context. So let me just you know, share with you a few numbers there. More than uh, a year into the pandemic, over 100 million people were rushed into extreme poverty. Uh, we've seen the equivalent of 250 million job lost and a quarter billion people driven into acute hunger. And as mentioned in, your, in, in the report, and uh, you know, Doreen mentioned that the school children in low and lower middle income country had by October lost nearly 15 weeks of schooling due to the lockdown. So there is a broader issue around the hard-won human capital gains that we've seen in the past decade 
in many countries are at risk. And what Doreen just shared uh, on the gender uh, gap is also alarming. So all this, the whole discussion around digital and what digital can play within this very difficult global context of, of the pandemic is, is, I think, very important. Uh, and we cannot, I think, as, as a community interested in this topic, we cannot afford uh, more red lights in our inclusion indicator from availability, affordability, readiness, and uh, relevance. So I think, I mean, if we mobilize the same energy and the same goodwill uh, that we've seen around the emergency response from a, a good collaboration between the public and the private sector, a good collaboration among the partners uh, working in this topic. Um, I think we could accelerate um, the objective of making sure that uh, the target of fuller connectivity by 2030 is achieved. Uh, in this, again, uh, crisis and this post-pandemic world, uh, you know, nine years to this uh, uh, target may seem like an, an eternity. Uh, so how do we continue to work together is very important. And again, congratulations uh, for this report because it really helps, you know, putting numbers into the vision, into the ambition. We know, you know, the starting point and having this, you know, five-year uh, data that shows how uh, things have progressed is very important for policymakers and for all of us as we want to help you know the client countries uh, get to the target of really fully leveraging digital for for a true transformation of the economy thanks robert no 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 thank you very 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 much patina um you know you, you point out um a couple of things you know, in, in terms of thinking about the shift from the uh, coverage gap, the digital divide, right? It's, it's a new divide. Maybe we're talking about, um, you know, an inclusion divide. So it's a, a digital inclusion divide. It's not just a digital access um, divide. And that's really part of this shift from coverage to usage. And this, by the way, is in terms of really one of the paradoxes. As more people are online and can benefit, which we've seen significantly, benefiting from being online and being connected during the pandemic, uh, it just reinforces that the people who are not yet online are further disadvantaged. And so this is one of the paradoxes of success because it's only success for part of the world's population. And, and again, um, this year's study really, really reinforces that. So thank you uh, very much. Um, you know, each year, uh, and it, you know, as, as one of uh, part of the panel, one of the panelists, uh, we have a an operator, a uh, mobile operator, because they're the ones who are on the front lines, um, building out the networks, getting that coverage out there, getting people connected, and it's it's a real, real, real pleasure uh, this year to invite my, um, uh, old, he's not old, I'd say old friend, long term longtime friend, uh, Kareem Lucina, who's the executive vice president and chief external affairs officer at Millicom. Um, pe many people know Millicom, not as Millicom, but as the Tigo brand um, in uh, Central America and South America. Um, and so welcome, Kareem. This is really great. I really appreciate your joining us. You know, what are some of the main learnings from the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of connectivity that you've seen in your countries where you operate? Um, and and, and what, what could we do differently to ensure uh, how do we address some of these questions that have been uh, raised by, by the other panelists in terms of um, closing the digital divide? I mean, how do you see it in your countries? And do you have any sort of provocative new ideas and how we can do that and by the way uh, achieve it more achieve it faster than the 2030 goal because as Bettina points out right it's a nice goal but nine years in the internet age is a very long time so Karim uh, looking forward to your reflections and insights thanks Bob and uh, what the other people don't know if Bob gave me like one hour to answer to all of this. I'm joking, but uh, uh, look, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for organizing this, Bob, and really kudos to Facebook because uh, 
and this is a very important report, very thorough. So congratulations to the uh, to the to the writers, let's say the creators of the report, and uh, and it's a pleasure to be with Doreen, Walid, and all of you uh, here. You know, it's um, so look. When I look at uh, a year ago, because everything started a year ago, um, you see the difference of what happened. You can get some positive messages and some to do that we need to improve. The positive message is, hey, who would have thought that the crisis like this would have been managed in that way? You know, my kids stayed at home for a year. They learned to use Zoom better than their father. Uh, they did all their school uh, in that way. Uh, schools got most of the time virtualized. I say most of the time because obviously the gap that we see in the study between developed countries and developing countries is pretty high. But the reality is that the net, the good news is that the network have been able to handle it, and that's the great news. And it uh, and it's a great news because it shows that uh, those seventy five percent of private investments that are there building those networks are have been key. And why I'm insisting on that is because you know. We are private companies, and uh, you know, we finance those those investments on the market. Uh, it also shows that uh, in moment of crisis, government and ecosystem, and I insist on the ecosystem because it's not only us telecom operators, but it's all the ecosystem. It's uh, the natural manufacturers, the uh, the uh, OEMs, it's Facebook, it's everybody else together uh, have been able to really work on solutions. And we need to learn from that because when we will get all our vaccines and this crisis will be uh, will be forgotten uh, or at least will be on our back uh, i think we should learn to uh, to continue to work in that way uh, in a really important ppp constantly looking for the best solution to connect all the unconnected uh, and also to increase our connectivity so that's for me super super important and I don't think there will be a there will be a return to what was happening in the beginning of 2020. I think we will be all in a new normal, uh, let's say from 2022 or end of 2021, and we will have to learn on that basis. So when I look at this, I look at our countries, okay, and uh, and I think uh, Walid means a very good comment and very important comments there, and I really thank him for that. Uh, it's we look at the networks and we look at the coverage. And, uh, and you know, and you look at the difference. You know, one one thing that I was really interested in the report was, and it was a little worrying in a certain sense, was the slowing down of the 4G coverage. Uh, and why I'm saying this is, 4G is coverage is essential for the 5G. Okay, we need to get to a 4G coverage of I don't know, 85, 90 percent to be sure that. Uh, uh, that uh, we will be able to deploy after that 5G. So I think that the real core, when I look at the report, is we need to focus a lot in the next month for a few years in all our countries to get that coverage very high uh, in order to be able to then develop on that basis 5G. And let let be clear here, we are a believer of 5G, you know, and if I use a uh, if I use Colombia, we started the, some of the first trial in 2017. So, you know, yeah, this is not about delaying. It's about really focusing on preparing and doing the things in the right way in order to be sure that the technology keep moving and we are not creating a new divide. Uh, because what we have to be careful is not insisting on doing investments in the places where, you know, urban areas and etc., and then forgetting the, uh, the part that is unconnected today. And for those unconnected parts, we, we clearly know what's going on there. You know, there it's, a, it's a low density areas, more complicated to connect in a lot of countries, lack of electricity, uh, impossibility to get the right of ways. There are a lot of reasons. OK, so what we have to do is to work together, identify. And there is no one size fits all solution. That's the other part. When I'm looking at the numbers, you see a real big differences on the uh, on, on the percentage compared to the region, but even in the regions, there are huge differences. So what we need to look like, it's really uh, priorities that we are adapting market to market. Some urban areas have a specific treatment, but then you have the regional side that needs to be treated in a totally different way. So that's something very important. And then, you know, Bob asked me for something uh, a little provocative. And, uh, and, you know, Bob knows I love to be provocative. 
and uh, that's part of my DNA. You know, I don't know if it's the Italian side or the Tunisian side or the side living in Miami now, but uh, uh, but the reality is, when I look, when we look at all this, one of the biggest costs that all the operators have are network building. You know, the wall network capacity that we need to continue. But then, as Bob was saying, there is a whole part about what we pay to have access to the spectrum, the regulatory fees that we pay on the spectrum. And these are, in a certain sense, huge taxes that you pay on it to have access to that scarce resource. If we consider connectivity as a digital a national strategy obligation, we need to start looking at it in a way that we should not look at Spectrum as a way to get as much cash as we can from the operators in order to reinvest it somewhere else. Now we should not look at it as an essential resource in order to allow the, all the countries to be connected and to connect all their citizens. So when you look at the latest development, you see that a lot of develop, developed countries are having their Spectrum being sold less and less uh, less, less and less, you know, less and less expensive. Okay, let's forget the, the U.S. Uh, latest auction, but the, the U.S. market is totally different in a certain sense compared to the rest of the world. And you know, I'm coming from AT&T. I can, I, 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 I can, I can, I can confirm that every day. But the reality is, we should look at spectrum and we should look at a pricing model that allows really to allow the operators to invest that money to cover. And that's exactly what Walid was talking about is it's not to get more cash and to get more money and etc but it's really to be able to to cover more and to get to all the unconnected and you can do it with universal funds you can do it in totally different ways but the universal funds should be used to cover those white zones and not to do other things and that's the re and that's the other part last thing and i promise i shut up bob most of us finance ourselves on the market because as i said i think the bid the abd is uh, is, is saying that 75% of all networks are financed at private level. So when you finance yourself on the market, you know, you need to convince people to invest in you or to, you know, in order to develop uh, the network in those countries. And every country is of a different uh, ratio uh, of return. So what you need to be sure as governments and in general altogether, but as governments specifically, is that you're creating the right incentive in order to bring those investments there. That's super important. And this is something that we should work all together. And uh, because the reality is that there is every time an expectation that people are going to build and do things automatically without seeing that, you know, you need to, you need to attract that investment. You need to attract all those players. You need to attract all the future market. It's like, uh, it's like a snowball, you know, going down. If you're able to launch a snowball and you have the right incentives, and this is a work that can be done, World Bank, ITU, IMF, local governments, all together, ecosystem. If we're able to do that, we will get in the success. But for me, the easy one that we should look tomorrow morning is really start looking at spectrum in a way, uh, that, that in a strategic way that allows operators to use all their investments in building those networks and building more capacity instead of having to pay a huge amount of money to the Ministry of Finances and to be considered as a cash cow. And this is not about a specific country. This is an issue that comes everywhere. And we should look at those great examples that you have around the world. If you look at the latest UK auction, it's a good example of how much the price went down. And it's a bold decision because it's also a very complicated decision for government to get less money in their, uh, in their finance. But it's a huge long-term investment. And what we are looking here is long-term because we need to be sure that our countries are ready to be not the next Silicon Valley, because I think there is only one, and Bob represents that Silicon Valley so well with his company. But we need to create those next opportunities uh, in all the countries in order to allow them to get opportunities for the citizens. And that's the Tunisian who speaks in me, because when I go to my little house in, uh, in Gerba, uh, in the south of Tunisia, I can tell you that connectivity is not exactly there. And it's not and one of the reasons is because the conditions are incredibly difficult in order to invest there. So what we need to look at is really creating the right opportunities and be bold, for example, by decreasing price of spectrum. Thank you, Bob. No, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, This is, um, you know, I've asked you to be provocative, and you are. On the other hand, what we've seen is that Colombia is already thinking along these lines, and the vice minister talked about that. And this is something that we have talked about consistently um, uh, at the 
at the ITU, at the Broadband Commission. Uh, it's something that we've, you know, uh, Bettina and the World Bank has talked about as well. And by the way, um, you know, we we have uh, this is we could call this a Tunisia panel since both you and Bettina have uh, roots in uh, Tunisia, uh, which is which is which is great. Th th this has been a really terrific uh, terrific conversation. Lots of insights, great questions, um, uh, and also raising questions about going forward. Um, one of the things that I would point out is uh, one of the struggles that we had this year with the study the EIU had was the fact that some countries are not reporting their data to the ITU and there's a lag. In fact, some countries haven't, haven't updated their report, their data um, reports since 2017. And if you don't have the data, you can't even do the analysis yourself. So one of the things that um, uh, a, a takeaway is really a call out. And Doreen, this is something that I know is dear to your heart with uh, the indicators project and all the work that you do in the development sector um, or the development uh, bureau at, at, at the ITU. Um, you know, I really wanna thank Claire and the ITU for your great partnership, the great data and you know, the analysis and the report. I also wanna thank all of our you know, terrific panelists. You've all been, been, been great in terms of insights and reflections. You know, our discussion today has only covered the tip of the iceberg of what is a really rich reservoir of, uh, of data. And as Claire pointed out, all of the data are available on the EIU's website. And, and we urge everybody to go there, download it, use it, use it, create your own analyses. Um, and both, you know, we in the EIU are extremely interested in hearing about how you've used it. If you've written reports, we'd love to see those uh, as well. And as Claire pointed out, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. You know, we've talked a little bit about how this year our launch was once again virtual because of the pandemic, uh, but I'm looking forward to getting back to Barcelona for next year's launch. Uh, of the sixth annual uh, Three Eyes study. And I hope to see everybody there then. Uh, really looking forward to that. So I wanna thank everybody very, very much for a really rich discussion and uh, presentation of the data. So thank you very much. Market women have a range of backgrounds, but most important to emphasize is they are resilient, they are flexible, and they are very, very hardworking. In Uganda, there is still a lot of work to bridge the digital gap it's in terms of cost, in terms of access, in terms of affordability. COVID-19 brought very many dimensions into life, but especially in business trading online became very crucial. And with the women in the markets, it changed their mindset to think about digitalizing business. Unfortunately, lockdown The Market Garden app provided a way of trade and it became a solution for safety and health. The market women would be in the market receiving orders. And the people in the homes would also get their food without interacting to reduce their exposure. COVID-19 is not a good thing. We are not a good thing. We are not a good 
as a development practitioner, it is my responsibility to study the environment and see what is possible. And I implore development partners out there to come and support this initiative so that the women in Africa, all women in the markets, are able to use this innovation. It shouldn't only stop in Uganda, but it can be expounded to benefit more women on the continent.